grew up in New Mexico, and my husband is a native Texan, went to UT, um, and part of what I love, there are many things I love in life, but one of them is cowboy boots. I wear a lot of cowboy boots. All my boots have been made and bought in Texas. So, of course, I had to wear them today. So, good morning. Welcome back from the break. I'm so excited to talk with you. As Mary said, um, so I work at this company called Slack. Anyone, does anyone use Slack here? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We value your business. <laughs> and if it works perfectly today, hopefully, we hope it will. That is all part of some of the things you'll see today. So, um, since you all know what Slack is, we're not going to talk about this part. This is what I eat, sleep, breathe every day. Um, we have offices all around the world. We have over 350 engineers, man 60 managers, and I run one of those five organizations that is infrastructure. So what do we mean by under pressure? So let's go back in time to October 15th, 2015. That was the first day at Slack for me. So my manager welcomes me and he says to me, we're so glad you're here and in two months we're going to have a big event. There's going to be press, there's going to be publicity, we've booked the venue, so don't screw it up. So this is me, um, actual photo. Uh, so, so why was this hard? Well, it was hard because at a rapidly growing company, we are adding new people every single day. We are onboarding new folks. We're bringing them up to speed. We have to build trust and rapport, ensure everyone is on the same page. And every day that goes by, we are getting closer and closer to that deadline. So what happened? So do any of you build integrations or apps on top of Slack? Anyone used our APIs? Okay, cool. A few of you raising your hands. Fantastic. Oh, they want me to, to walk over here. No problem. Oh, I, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I could be over there in the dark. Um, stand here. So the big deadline that I was talking about earlier, this was the launch of the Slack app directory. So before December 2015, if you wanted to build on top of Slack, and before I even thought about working at Slack, I was building on top of the product, you had to host the app on your own website, you had to have good SEO, people had to be able to find it, and now we had a directory. And so this was the big event. We had this beautiful space in San Francisco. It was all dolled up. Um, and you know, this is the evening, and the... All, all the like VIPs filter in and they sit in these seats and our CEO Stuart Butterfield takes the stage and he's talking about how excited we are to launch the platform and you know, behind the scenes we create a ephemeral channel a launch channel for every single launch that we do so this is the actual conversation that was going on as we were deploying and things were going live and everyone is celebrating Stuart takes the stage app directories out um, we celebrate, that is a picture, I'm, I'm like almost at the end with my hands like very intensely in the air. I am also wearing cowboy boots in that picture. And so we have this fantastic night, we, we deploy, it like worked despite all of the odds. And the next day, my manager pulls me into his office and he says to me, so why was it successful? Like, what's the secret? And I think to myself, like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, like maybe, it was, maybe it was a million different things. And this is the core question I have been asking myself throughout my entire career. What makes teams successful? When we fail, we often overanalyze and look at what went wrong, but when we succeed, we think that it was because we were special and we were just that smart and we were just that hard. But is that really why we were successful? Through this talk, we're gonna be digging into this and at the end, you're gonna, I'm gonna share some ideas of why I think we were successful and how hopefully you can be successful as well. 
but your miles will always vary. So fast forward nine months. So we were just in December of 2015, and now we're in the summer of 2016. Uh, performance and reliability had become very, very important at Slack. And this is why. So this is a graph of daily active usage in the product. So I joined in this nice blue part. We're here in the purple part. Now, as an engineer, when I look at this graph, this is what I see. The systems you build when you have those daily active user usage numbers are fundamentally different than the num that what you build when you're up in that upper quadrant. Now, ideally, everything scales out. It's perfect. It's seamless. You add 5 million daily active users, and you know, everything's just you know, um, rainbows and unicorns. But like, let's be frank, that's not what happened. Um, and so we, we came to this realization as an engineering organization that what got us here, the processes, the systems, the teams even, the structure of the teams, that wasn't going to get us to that next phase of growth. So this is a story in part of infrastructure. So we form an infrastructure team, the organization that to this day I continue to lead and love all the folks on my team. Such an incredible team. So anyone work on infrastructure at their companies here? Okay, fabulous. So y'all 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 love this. So this is infrastructure. <laughs> uh, and well, to just hammer this point home, so this outage that happened on January 9th, in part, this was a challenge of hyper growth with infrastructure. And so, Halloween, again, pressure, 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 under pressure, channeling David Bowie. Um, so, it was an intense time. So this is a story, again, of infrastructure and of how I thought about replicating success and building out this new team to address those critical performance bottlenecks that we were seeing. So is anyone familiar with the research that came out of Google in 2016? So it's all about how to build high-performing teams. There was a huge splash in the New York Times Magazine of what they found when they did all of this research. Anyone, is anyone familiar with this body of work? Okay, so I see, I see a few hands coming up. So, um, highly recommend reading, like very, very interesting piece of um, research on people and on engineering teams. But I will save you the work, and I will not, I will not read aloud as much as we would all love to enjoy that. Um, I will save you the work, and I will tell you what the thesis was. It was the most important thing is psychological safety. So psychological safety means you're sitting at a round table right now with a bunch of people that maybe you met at the conference, maybe you didn't, but at that table, if you threw out an idea and people th said, that's a terrible idea, why would you do that? Lack of psychological safety. If you threw out an idea and people said, wow, that is a fascinating idea, I'd never heard about it some more, let's talk about it. If that was the response that you got, you'll probably share more ideas. But if you throw something out, if you show vulnerability and you get shut down, you're not going to share any thoughts in the future. And so psychological safety is incredibly, incredibly important. So now that we know that, we're like, okay, this is you know, a fundamental tenet of successful teams. How do you do that? So when you read the article, one of the things that myself and a, a woman I look up to and deeply respect, Sarah, who's at Salesforce now, she captured the essence so well in this tweet. So this is really important. We need to have psychological safety, but how on earth do we go about building psychological safety on our teams? And hold on, y'all. It's about to get even harder. So psychological safety is predicated on trust. There is a lot of well-known research that shows people are more likely to trust people that look 
like themselves. They are more likely to trust people who have the same background as themselves. They're more likely to trust people of the same gender. And so if we need to have psychological safety, which is predicated on trust, but we also know that diverse teams build better software. And diversity is predicated on having people from all genders, all backgrounds. So what do we do? And this is the core challenge that I faced when I joined Slack. This was the most diverse team that I had ever worked on, and we had to build that trust because we needed to have that psychological safety. So the question we're going to walk through today together, how do we create an environment that fosters psychological safety on diverse teams? What are we going to do? Well, first, I want to, oh, I, I will walk over here. What are the challenges of diverse teams? And how does this lack of trust manifest itself? Because maybe if we can get to the bottom of this lack of trust, we can figure out how to address it. I would argue that it manifests itself in conflict. So each of you sitting at the table today, you might be in a good mood. There was no traffic. It was really easy to get here. You're super excited to be here. Maybe you're frustrated because it took a long time. There was traffic. You, there wasn't enough coffee when you got to the break. And so every single person, you're coming up, you're showing up to work, and you're bringing your day, your life, everything with you, and you're viewing the world through that lens. So let's hold on to that thought. We'll need that thought in a second. So I argue that, I would argue that the toxic conflict happens when different people, people from different backgrounds, different genders, different colleges, different commutes that they had that day, are solving different problems that they think are the same problem. So we are all engineers. If I went up to you and I said, you know, the site's really slow. <laughs> what would you do? You probably, as I spoke those words, you maybe thought, oh yeah, it's got to be the database layer. layer. Some of you may have thought, oh, JavaScript gets us again. Some of you maybe thought, oh, the caching tier. It's got to be the caching tier. So let's say your boss comes to you. You're like, it's slow. And you're like, you're like oh, I know, I know what it's going to be. It's that database tier again. You go, you do a bunch of debugging. Someone else is working on this. You come together. You present your solutions. You're like, OK, I think it's this. I think it's this query. Like, there's this one query. It's taking forever. Um, and suddenly, your boss is like, that's not what I was talking about at all. And so you've got this wonderful thing that happens where you've got diversity of opinions and diversity of approaches, but you're solving different problems. And your boss says, or your, co or your co co coworker or colleague says, well, I meant slow like I think Comcast is slow today. And you're like, what? Like our internet provider? Why are you talking about this? And so suddenly, You've got all this conflict from a situation that could have yielded beautiful, diverse results. So you want different approaches, different approaches on the same problem. But I see this all the time in engineering teams that I've been part of throughout my career. I see this in engineering teams that I lead, that we are often very unclear on the problem that we're solving. <laughs> uh, and the way that you figure out what problem you're solving is you need clarity. So clarity is queen. How do you get clarity? So I argue that clarity comes from being as transparent as possible. How many of you are like committed code today? Okay, that's for, so like, so like a few. Okay, yeah, how about yesterday? Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Um, I'm glad that, you know, I'm sorry if you had to commit code like right now. Um, <laughs> So for every line of code that you commit, you are making decisions. You are codifying decisions. 
And the more information that you have about the problem that you're solving, and I would argue more importantly, the more information that you have about the problem you're not solving, the better decisions that you'll make. And so I really encourage all of you as leaders, aspiring leaders, managers, architects, some of the best conversations that have saved myself and the teams that I am so lucky to lead, the conversations that have saved us times have been about, okay, let's take a step back and let's figure out what's the problem we're solving. So here are some questions that you can use when, when getting that clarity. Now, so my argument, and we're going to walk through how to, again, more steps on how to do this. How do we create an environment that fosters psychological safety on diverse teams, well, that, that fosters that psychological safety? Well, let's talk about some trips, tips to get the clarity that you need. Okay, so let's do, I have a framework. I made a, a two by two axis framework that we will walk through. Um, together to figure out, are you on a high-performing team? So, everyone ready? All right. So, think about your team. Do you have a large degree of psychological safety? For example, you know your coworkers. You know them very well. You have great rapport, trust. You bounce ideas off of each other but y'all have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> Everyone's like, what's the goal of this project? Why do I, like, why do, for a lot of startups, what is this startup even doing anyway? <laughs> anyone, anyone been in the party? Like, I've been in the party quadrant many times before. And let me tell you, the party quadrant is a great quadrant to be in because you're like, we're having a great time, we're having the time of our lives, we don't know what we're doing, but it's, it's just fantastic. Now, think about that same situation. You have no clarity, you don't know what the goal is, you don't even know why the company may even exist. Let's say there's been another reorg, and you don't have that psychological safety uh, with your coworkers. Well, that's the chaos quadrant. This is the scariest quadrant to be in because you might feel um, insecure, you might feel scared, um, and you don't really know what you're supposed to be working on, so it might feel really volatile and chaotic. So really scary, chaos corner. Now, you have extreme clarity. Maybe your boss is looking over your shoulder being like, that should be an int and not a float. Um, but you don't have that trust. You feel scared, you feel worried maybe that you're making the wrong decisions. Well, this is the dictatorship corner. So again, a lot of clarity, but no psychological safety. And the quadrant that we want to be in, the quadrant for building the high-performing teams, is the quadrant where we have psychological safety, we feel comfortable, we can be our authentic selves, and we all are agreed on what the problems that are that we're solving. We understand how all of our code and everything that we work on, how that contributes to the bigger goals of the company. So how do we get ourselves into the high-performing teams quadrant? Not to worry, I have some tips. Um, this is the nail care emo emoji, if anyone would like to use it in Slack, big fan. Um, okay, so this, these are the things, the actual steps I took and mistakes that I made when I formed the infrastructure organization at Slack. So, first of all, oh, we went backwards. We will now go forwards. Now, forward in time. Um, so, y'all as leaders, managers, um, engineers, you can do all of these tips. And so, think about your team, and if you wa went to every single person on the team, and you said, what is the purpose of this team? What is our goal? Do you think that everyone would give you a different answer? I see a lot of people saying, absolutely. Uh, and and this, is, this happens all the time. And so the, if, if you, we did it, and so the way I tackled this was I did a survey with the team, and it was anonymous because I wanted people to be able to, to, to be forthright. Um, and so I did a survey saying, 
and, and the, again, the name was optional, because some people, they, they really love to put their name on the survey. So uh, <laughs> other people, they never put their name on a survey. So you know, best of both worlds. So this was really fascinating to ask people what the purpose of the team was. Because it was every single person thought the team existed for different reasons. And I, and I hypothesized that this would cause us a lot of conflict. Because when people had to make decisions about what to work on and what not to work on, they were, they were all coming back to different purposes of why the team existed. And then I wanted to get into some questions around what's working and what's not working. Now, do we have any Seinfeld fans in the audience? OK, a few, a few. So this was modeled after the airing of the grievances <laughs> during Festivus. So the reason that you want to have, and it doesn't matter if you haven't seen Seinfeld, it, the reason you want to have the airing of the grievances um, in the form is because people often have stuff they want to get off their chest. And they're like, someone needs to know that this is broken. And once they say it, they feel great. So you can air those grievances. You, ha you capture all this in the form. And then um, we had a big kickoff meeting where I collated all of this information together. Now, one tip I would suggest when, when going through this process is that if your team is growing fast or there have been a lot of reorgs or your startup maybe is struggling and you're, you're deciding on a new mission and new goals, then you should repeat this process every six months to ensure you're realigned because it's very natural for teams to drift and for missions to drift. Um, so we had this big two-hour meeting. We, had, we did it over lunch because a two-hour meeting just seems like impossibly long. Um, but it was really key when running this meeting, and a tip that I would give for all of y'all is you want to start off on a positive note. Let's get to know each other. Let's talk about our day. Let's, and then you can go into what is our purpose, air the grievances so that you can move on, and then end on that high note. You want people to come out of this jazzed and excited about the future after they've aired their grievances. Then they go forth and conquer. So, Let's talk about the mission for Slack infrastructure, or at least the mission that we had 18 months ago. So we came up with a really memorable acronym for, this, for our mission and our purpose so that people would remember what it was. Wraps for cash. <laughs> this, is, this, this was our mission for a substantial amount of time. And again, reliability, availability, performance, building blocks for product, reduce the, the cost of Slack. And it's short, it's pithy, and whenever I would run into a team member in the cafe, say, what's the mission? Wraps for cash. And everyone knew it was meant, because often people will be like, our mission is integrity for the customer. And you're like, how do I use that to guide my decisions? So again, concrete, short, to the point. Um, oh, there it is again, amazing. All right. So this. One, something really interesting happened after we went through this exercise and aligning on wraps for cash, which was, um, now how many of you spend time talking on the phone with candidates, people you want to interview for your team, or interviewing them on site? A lot of people doing interviews and, okay, a lot, so I see a lot of hands going up. So once we refined what the mission was, this had huge downstream impact on helping us sell our team to candidates because suddenly everyone was saying the same thing to the candidate. Because <laughs> that's a really, I mean, this is, we laugh because how many of you have been in an interview and there's different people interviewing you and they're like, the team does this and the next person says, oh, the team does that. And you're thinking to yourself, oh dear, like what does this team do? So suddenly we were aligned and everyone had their pitch down. And I don't mean pitch like in a sales way, but they, we were all on the same page about what the team did. Um, now, I have managed several teams that didn't have a clear mission. Or mistake, a mistake that I, ha I made was I've inherited teams and I have assumed they had a, a, a mission. And I assumed they knew who their customer was. And that was a really big mistake. Because when it came to prioritizing work, again, getting back to the clarity piece, everyone would work on different things because the team thought they had different customers. They were like, well, sales is asking us for this, and don't we always prioritize the sales team? And another engineer is saying, well, 
marketing wants this. Don't we always prioritize marketing? And so there was always this clear, clear, this clear misalignment, this foggy misalignment amongst the priorities. Now, for tip number four, again, can I get a show of hands of how many of y'all use Slack or at least use some sort of like messaging platform on your teams? Okay, so it feels like almost every, Almost everyone is using some sort of messaging product. So what I would really encourage you is we created a channel for our team. And a the, the goal of this channel was banter. Banter about work, constructive banter, people being able to talk about, hey, I'm going to work from home today because my mom's coming into town. Giving people a place in the product where they could talk amongst their team and the goal of this was contributing back to psychological safety. If there was this safe place where people could talk with their colleagues, exchange notes, ideas. Now, sure, that also happens in meetings, but people are living in messaging platforms now. So creating that special space was really, really instrumental and hugely helpful. Um, OK, I want to talk about team lunch. And the thing that I learned, the very surprising, unexpected thing I learned from Team Lunch. This is a photo of, um, from a couple years ago of myself and some of the folks on the team. And so we don't have catered lunch at Slack because we really encourage people to go out in the community and frequent and, pay, and, and give their business to communities in the, um, in, to businesses in the community. And this gave us a perfect, uh, way to try out, okay, let's all go to lunch as a team every other week. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, people are going to come together, they're going to have lunch, they're going to build psychological safety, it's going to be great. So, yes, there was some of that, but the real value came from the discussion around where to go to team lunch. <laughs> now, this was totally shocking to me because I had no idea people cared so much about where we would go for team lunch. And there's a whole contingent of folks on the team, this is a true story, who want to go to McDonald's every single week. And they were embarrassed <laughs> to admit that. But when we started having the team lunch conversations, they were like, hey, who wants to go to McDonald's? And then someone's like, I want to go to McDonald's. <laughs> someone's like, I want to go. And so suddenly, all of this banter around and this like hilarious discussion that people would think is totally off topic, that was huge, huge bonding factor for the team. I did not expect this at all. And it, one of the things that I'm struggling with in full transparency is the team is so big now that we can't have the, the discussion about team lunch because there's like 60 people on the team. And so we're trying to split it off into sub-teams. Um, but anyway, team lunch, highly recommend it. Um, our final steps, we're getting in the home stretch, y'all, is goals. So how many of you all at your companies have goal setting process? Like a quarterly goal, a yearly goal? Okay, everyone's, most people's hands are going up, fabulous. So the, we used to do goals in a like, okay, top down, here's the goals. And then I, I would ask everyone on my team, what are your goals? And people would, you know, write down a few things, and we'd have, we'd share them in a one-to-one, -one, um, hopefully not an awkward one-to-one, -one, but a one-to-one, one-on-one meeting. And then I tried at one point a couple years ago to say, okay, everyone share your goals in the team channel, because remember, we have that team infrastructure channel. So I was like, write your goals down and, and, and choose one goal where you need someone else's help to complete that goal, because we're a team. We need to depend on and trust each other. Again, getting towards psychological safety. So the first time I did this, it was amazing because at, you'll see in that last bullet point, there were so many people who all had the same goal. <laughs> it was like, improve the unit tests. There's an example. So I was like, great, y'all gonna get together and work on this goal as a group, as a unit. And that was substantially more successful than one-off improvements from everyone. Um, we also had a lunch where I asked everyone to share a goal that they wanted other people to help them hold themselves accountable for. 
And then I also asked, of course, for feedback on this process. And the team loved this. And I also shared my goals. Like, I was the first one. Because usually you might say, OK, everyone, what are your goals? And it's like crickets. People are, are, are like, oh, how do I, what, what do I do? What is Julia expecting? So I was like, here are my goals. And then it was, I, I felt like I knew that we were on to something when I started getting a lot of feedback about my own goals, <laughs> constructive feedback from my team. Um, and then finally, let's see, seven, we came up with a mascot. So why do, why do colleges and high schools have mascots? Team identity. So when I joined and I, I was on the platform team, we had a platypus. That was our team identity. And people made t-shirts and were like, we're the platypi. And again, it seems silly, but it really bonded people together. So here's the recap of all of the ideas that I'll share with you. Some may be appropriate, some may not. Leave some food for thought there. And finally, um, I will leave you with this, that if you combine psychological safety and clarity, then I have found that is the best way to have a high-performing team. And I wish and hope that all of you are on high-performing teams now. And if you're not, I tweet at me your questions. Happy to help. Thank you all so much for having me here. Giddy up. Thanks.